Hello Slashaholics. Be sure to subscribe, click that like button, and click that bell. Also, check out the companion channel, the 80s Slasher Library After Hours, for all the great podcast and original content. Links are in the description below. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. You can find those links in the description below as well, as well as our merch store and the Patreon page. You can support the channel for as low as $2 per month, get some great stuff like free ebooks, free merch, voice a character, and an audiobook narration, and so much more. Tonight's upload is brought to you by our patrons on the Patreon page. That's Tyrone Kennard, Nick Velcarve, Jeffrey Quick, Daniel Mackey, David Arnold, Alex Vanover, Krista Campbell, Rob Davey, Jay Gardner, Willow Ravenwood, Lauren Vaught, Kristen Kay, Michael, William Schaefer, Liam Anderson, Bree, Bonanza Jellybean, Ryan Woodward, Allison Saib, Iron Alexa, Hawaii, Cecilia Spears, Sean Campbell, Catherine McClear, Simonoli, and Carl Eakins. That's deep. <coughs> Is that? Welcome to another episode of Out of Print Slashers. I am Sean Campbell. I am joined with the 80 Slasher Librarian, Josh LaRue. How are you doing today? Doing good, Sean. Excellent. And we have a special guest tonight. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Vincent DeSanti, probably best known as the director of a Friday the 13th fan film called Never Hike Alone, as well as uh, the owner and operator of Womp Stomp Films, which we create independent genre short films and other content uh, co-producing and things like that. Uh, and that's me. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming on with us tonight. And thank you for reading uh, one of my favorite novelizations uh, written by Simon Hawk, and that is Friday the 13th, 6. Because mm-hmm. what I'd like to do tonight is kind of a retrospective on Jason and how how you as a fan got from the movies, you know, to the fan film and your version of Jason, which there in the background, I just love that look. Uh, awesome look. Uh, I feel like I guess, with all the looks, some, some of the Jason started to look more extra and extra and extra. This went back to the simple simplicity mm-hmm. of the, the silhouette and the darkness. I yes. really liked it. I, w- I just went back and rewatched this film, and there's a couple things I caught that I'll bring up later, but just talking about the look right now. Um, I definitely like that. Kind of mm-hmm. a return to form. And that was definitely a big part of it was simplifying. Yeah, he could like, like from a distance, 
he would just look like somebody standing like on a hill or something, you know. And by the time he's by the time he's close enough for you know you're in trouble, it's mm-hmm. too late. So yeah, it's too late. Um, yeah, I like that. Uh, thought it was cool how he was in that puzzle game too. I read a thing about that. Did yeah, he, that was a. He, go, he made ahead. it into the game. Yeah, he made it into the Friday the Thirteenth puzzle mobile game, uh, which I think was done by Blue Wizard. And they had reached out to us. I kind of jokingly reached out to them because they were like, hey, we're looking for characters in the game or something like that. Or you could and enter to win. And I was like, hey, what about Kyle McLeod and Ghost Jason? That'd be pretty cool. And they messaged me directly and were like, that's actually a great idea. We'd love to include you. We can, we can do that. Um, this was before the lawsuit. And so when the game was released, Ghost Jason and Kyle were already in it. They just weren't unlocked yet. And so they, we skirted under the law because when they, when that, the lawsuit came up. Um, we had already been in the game, and all they had to do was unlock us, and so that was allowed. Uh, and yeah, we were kind of one of the last things to get released, you know. So that was a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool honor. See, I had read about that, and that confused me so much because, and I'm not going to make a big discussion about the video mm-hmm. games and the lawsuits, but uh, Jason X had accidentally been put into the game on Friday the Thirteenth, the video game before. Mm-hmm lawsuit hit they had accidentally put it out to some players so he was in the game too and they weren't able to unlock him so i don't you know it's it's different for every entity i think uh yeah and it's also a level of of gameplay too because you're talking about a mobile game that's very simple very simple characters and then you're talking about a video game that yeah jason might have been in there and maybe some of the grendel was but there's so much more that has to go into it probably to get fixed, and there were probably so many bugs that by unleashing it, it probably made everything worse. So yeah, right. I'm, I'm sure they had their reasons. There, there's no, trust me, no one at that, that studio was going, well, F them, don't give them anything. You know <laughs> no. what I mean? Yeah. They were like, we wanted to give them as much as possible. I know that they were really planning a lot of things. I got to work with those guys. I actually designed a kill for the game um, so. and heard a lot of things that were going to come out for it and was very disappointed. Which when, one did you design? Uh, free Kick. Ah. Yeah, so it was, it was one of the last ones to come out. So that was uh, that was another huge, huge honor to be able to do that. Um, but yeah, it's sad that we didn't get the the rest of the game. But who knows when this all this stuff gets settled up and a new game console comes out and interest comes back, maybe maybe we'll get a second chance. Yeah, it's not it's like that's the last time Jason's going to be in a video game. I mean, Mm-mm. we still need Worm Jason. He needs to be put in there somewhere. Yeah. Right. Um. So, yeah, I just recently narrated the uh, first book, Mm -hmm. Friday the 13th, the original movie. And uh, you were talking to us before we started recording here about how you liked in Jason Lives, how we got into Jason's head a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I I read Jason 6 first by Simon Hawk before I did the original Friday the 13th. So I was like, oh, this is going to be awesome, you know. And then I get into the book, and I wasn't thinking that the book had to play by the same rules as the movie, keeping the killer a secret, even though we all know who the killer is. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you didn't get any of that insight, and it was just, I don't know what you thought of it, Sean, but it was kind of a bore. Uh, um, may I interject on that point? Yeah. Uh, in the novelization of Friday the 13th Part 2, you do go into a lot of Jason's childhood, and I feel like parts of that were recycled into Friday the 13th Part 6, because when I was listening... Oh. To part six, I was, I was like, this sounds familiar, and it's, oh, it, it's from the second one that, may, I don't I don't know which book came out first, honestly, because, I, you know, the books didn't have to come out chronologically with the movies, they might have come out after the fact, but uh, I'm curious to see what you think on that one as well. Well, I, I a lot of people, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm reading that one right now, putting out chapters of that one, and it's, I've done part three by Michael Avalon, but I haven't done part three by Simon Hawk. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird, Vincent. Uh, mm-hmm. There were two versions of Friday the 13th 3 mm-hmm. by two different authors. And uh, the one that you said you'd read some of, that was uh, based off like a really early script for the movie. Yeah. No, there was uh, it, by, not by Simon Hawk. It was by Michael. It was the other yeah. one with, yeah. the, with the old Cooper mask on the, on the cover, which was cool. It's a, it's a cool looking book. I wish Jason would have wore that mask just once in the movies, you know, like we had it on the cover of that book, <laughs> the cover of uh, The New Beginning back on VHS. Um, but yeah, so uh, I started on that one, and a lot of people say they respect the first movie, Friday the 13th, but it's hard for them to like sit through it anymore. Um, where do you stand on that? 
I mean, there, there's only one film in the series that's really hard for me to sit through, and that's the remake. Um, I get about halfway through, and I have to turn it off because I get so bored by just everything. I'm just not... I don't know. When you watch all the old ones, and then you're waiting for to come, that just never really never really did it for me. And um, it's one of the things that kind of led to me to making Never Hike Alone because I was one like I walked out of that theater thinking like, oh my God, like I went into this with this expectation of, of what this film could be. I was told that it was going to be parts two through four, uh, you know, all kind of jammed together, which is a good, a good thing that you would think. Three really good films within those entries, kind of pulling those stories together, trying to make one complete story. Um, Derek Mears is Jason. Um, uh, the Rambo style, Jason, all these different things. And it just felt that like what they had promised as a meal came out overcooked. Right. And it was like, you guys have all the right elements, but you've just spent way too much energy on all the wrong things. Well, with like, all the nudity and the massive amount, I started calling the movie Jason XXX. You know? just, yeah. So it was, it was so like, weird. it just, it just felt like it, it felt like the, the films had learned nothing. Like if you're going to go back and remake something and, and you can have your opinion about Friday the 13th, how you feel about one through Freddy versus Jason or up to Jason X, Jason goes to hell or just the Paramount era. It's that when you go back and you want to remake something, you want to improve upon it and you want to take all the mistakes that it made before. If it had um, a lot of the times we make we remake films that don't need to be remade. Uh, but in the case of Friday the 13th, it's one of the strongest contenders for being remade because it is such a broken franchise. None of the continuity lines up. Um, Jason changes look so much, but could you imagine if they started a new Jason, a new franchise, with a Jason that was consistent through multiple films, with a story that was that was consistent through multiple films, and logic that stood up? You know, even if it was movie logic, if it was supernatural logic, at least it was a logic through line that connected between multiple films. And I think that I went in expecting, here I am, going to be sitting in the first film of the next three films that are coming out over the next four years. And... We still haven't got a film since. And so I was mediocrely disappointed with 2009 and I didn't like, I wasn't too hurt over it. But I think over the years, since it's the last film that was made, it's kind of like the catalyst for no more films getting made and like go through the 2000s before the, the lawsuit. I kind of have this like, maybe until another film gets made and we move past it, I'll be able to go back and give it the new, the new beginning and Jason goes to hell treatment, which is at first I didn't like it. And then after some time and the wounds healed, I'm able to kind of accept it for what it is. But right now the wounds haven't healed and, and I'm still kind of pushing that whatever comes out next, it's not a, a repeat of 2009, um, which, you know, just didn't, just didn't do it. And, and we're here in the kind of a situation that we're in because of it. Yeah. The, I got, I got to I got to agree. The uh, remake was not, it, they built it up so much, way too much. Um, but what we I did it to ourselves too, as fans, I mean, we got really hyped up, but it's, yeah, you have all this time, you have all this, to, to draw from and like that's what we got and i just was i could i could sit here for two hours and nitpick at it, least it had a fantastic soundtrack in my in my opinion what i mean it's it like, say, say what you want about the movie but i love that the background uh scores sure. by steve jablonski he did the remake of texas chains on massacre mm -hmm. the remake of friday 13 nightmare on elm street they're all done by the same composer and i kind of yeah. liked how he tweaked his score for each of the movies so i mean say what you want about the movie but i, I like the Music. Yeah, well, that was a, that was one of the things for me. I think that the score kind of fell short. It didn't have any violins. It didn't have any strings. It was all drones and and all this stuff kind of like thumping in the background. And I was like, is this this doesn't feel like Friday the Thirteenth. This feels like another movie. And I think that that was kind of part. Like it felt like it lost a little bit of identity. Um, and ultimate, yeah. But I mean, yeah, to each his own. I know friends who who love two thousand nine, uh, every bit of it. So it's it's kind of like it's just like any Friday the Thirteenth fan. We like certain things about certain movies. We don't like things about other movies, but we can watch pretty much all of them, no matter what which one you put on. Well, that was the first one I got. That was the first Jason movie I got to see in theaters because I mean mm -hmm. he started coming out 2009. I got into horror movies in 2005, so I I didn't get to see any of the originals. I only saw the remakes, so that that skews that, my perception I, a little bit. Yeah, if you had had Manfredini first, I don't know if you would have been if you would have enjoyed the uh, background as much. Right. <laughs> so. Uh, I gotta say, there's two ways that I've made myself enjoy the remake, and I've talked about this before with Sean. Yeah. Uh, one of them is Sam Winchester versus Jason. <laughs> uh, the other one is I 
make up this extra plot in my head as I'm watching it. And instead of it being a remake, I call it a sequel. And uh, where it's been like a decade since Jason's killed anybody, the town's smartened up, not sending anybody out there. Uh, so Jason's not been taking damage. He's regenerated almost back to human. Uh, but yeah, it's it's at the bottom. All the plot people leave around have turned into actual plants. You know, so it's just it's ten years. So <laughs> it's at the bottom of my list, though that one. And surprisingly, a lot of people can't believe this, but Part Three is really low on my list. And uh, Jason X and Jason Goes to Hell and Part Five are high on my list. That's and, funny. Yeah, it's that's what I love about the horror community, man. Uh, you can tell other people, and they might be like, "What." But they don't try to shame you for it or nothing. No. You know? I actually part three is probably one of the most loved in the series, and and for good reason. But it's but it's a personal of mine. I don't find it as enjoyable as part four or part two. Yeah. I feel of the first four films, it is the most inferior, only because and the the only reason why it is is because it's the three D makes it fun, but the three D also leaves them in this situation where everything is super brightly lit because they have to light for those three D cameras. And they spend too much time messing around with the cameras to come up with 3D gags rather than using the 3D gags to make something scary. Like ju so, juggling fruit. Uh, or a baseball a bat and a pole. And it's just like every, it was like, oh, it's 3D. You know what I mean? And, and, you know, they do it with the eyeball, which is fun. And maybe if they had a few more gags like that, I imagine the, the budget was getting somewhat churned on this. But, um, yeah, it's just not as succinct as two. Um, even though two is kind of thrown together, it actually makes some sort of a semblance. And Ginny's a really great final girl. Part four is obviously iconic with Zito and the way that he made it look. But three is just really bright. Um, I don't think Chris's story is as powerful as everyone else's story. Uh, right. The backstory of getting diddled by Jason at some point doesn't really fit into his M.O., so it seems out of character, and it always it, it always feels like a weird she scene. wakes up at home with no damage. It just there's yeah. a lot of questions that aren't answered, and the book gets even more confusing. The yeah, no, it's it's th I mean, three has its moments. Obviously, Shelley finding the mask, it, it has iconic moments. But as a film, it's I, I find it not as on point as some of the others. And then like part the thing about Jason X in part five is that they have such enjoyable moments. It's one of those things where they win you over with their lighthearted comedy that they kind of play in a different... They play to our, a different sensibility of, like, the strengths and weaknesses of Friday the 13th films. Jason X and Part 5 are probably two of the funniest films. Even Part 6 has a lot of comedy. Yeah. Um, but those are the most ones you watch because you're walking in going, it's so bad, it's good. And then you have the the films that are good. Six, four, two, one. I mean, those are, those are solid films. And then you have kind of, like, this sea of, like, hit and miss. Like films that like almost got there but didn't quite get there but aren't really that bad and are still watchable. So they, they're, it's it's kind of there. But it depends on people's taste and it, and it fluctuates between each person in the franchise. That's why you have so many different takes from so many different people. What I love about Jason X uh, in particular is that even though it's in space, it's in the future. At its core, it is a Friday the Thirteenth formula. You know. You mm -hmm. got you got the teens away from home, far out away from home, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, at first, there's a lot of adult supervision, but for most of the movie, there's very little. Uh, yeah, the adults are removed pretty quickly. Yeah, and Jason gets some really good kills in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it, for I don't know why. Maybe it's because it was the first one I saw in theaters. Uh, but it's it's up there towards the top. I hated Part Five for years. Uh, until I revisited it as an adult, mm -hmm. uh, it was a really good movie. You know, um, not I don't know why I ever hated it. Probably, probably as like a teen or kid, I was like, it's not Jason. It sucks. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's... To, to interject on this one, um, the the young the Jason young adult novels, in a nutshell, they're basically about Jason has been pulled into hell at the end of part nine and. The mask, people keep putting on the mask, and the mask fuses to them, and Jason's spirit is through the mask. And oh. it's almost a blend of Jason and that person, because the first guy is a hunter, so he shoots with a gun. The second guy is a fisherman, so he'll catch people, and the mask almost convinces them to kill people by pulling hmm. bad memories and shoving it in their face until they get angry enough to brutally murder somebody, so... Huh. It's been my personal fan theory that the ambulance driver in part five got the mask and it basically had Jason going through him.
I mean, it, there's a lot of flaws in that logic, but it's one of those fun little fan theories. Uh, I think it would be interesting that, you know, Jason really was in Part 5. It was just the mask. Well, I mean, he did – look at the way that Roy walked through that door, man, and just splintered the door. Um, or Pamela in Part 1 throwing people through windows. Mm-hmm. I thought she had a winch on her <laughs> Jeep or something. She was, what, 90 pounds? Yeah, no, it's like were they were – they, was Pamela and Roy on steroids or what? You know, I've right. always I've always been curious because he just blows that door to splinters walking through it. Um, it would have been funny if he just like bumped into it and he's like, "Ow!" Yeah, <laughs> and he has to open it. <laughs> I actually I have a funny story about that later, but I'll save that for after the slash because it's related, but it's just enough unrelated to where it's after the slash. Yeah, Vincent, I've always told people it would be funny in a Freddy movie if uh, the main character pulls Freddy out of a dream into the real world, and the <laughs> first thing he does is just start screaming in agony, you know, from all the from all the damaged nerves and everything, from all the burns since he's in the real wow. world. Wow. Just, ah! <laughs> just rolling around in the floor, credits roll. Um, he, also, uh, he, he brought up Jason Goes to Hell and the uh, young adult novels. The possession thing, a lot of people that turns them off, but it was it was pretty pretty cool to see Jason fusing with people. It's almost like Pamela was also installed into the people, you know, kill him, mm-hmm. Jason, kill him. Um, but there was a book in the Black Flame series called Hell Lake that kind of picks up after Jason goes to hell. We wanted to share this story with you. Uh, mm-hmm. This one I think is the most anybody's ever effed with the character of Jason, um, except for Jason X. Four, but yeah. we'll get into that later. Yeah. Is that the one with the cult? No, no, that's Church of the Divine Psychopath. That one's nothing compared to Death Moon. Oh my God! Uh, but Hell Lake, that, Jason, Death Moon of all the Jason I've ever seen in my entire life, Death Moon has to be the very bottom. <laughs> the bottom it's rung. It is the, the bottom. Uh, right. There's like the, yeah. So in in Hell Lake, Jason meets another serial killer in Hell. Mm. And uh, they become best friends in this book. Jason cries in this book. <laughs> um, Jason wears somebody's face in this book and drives a police car. Uh, he change, He gets rid of his hockey mask because he likes a welder's mask better. Someone um, shot him in the ass and he screamed and punched him in the face. And he, he shoots people with a rifle. Um, wow. That's not everything. I mean, that's just some of the stuff this guy... Uh, Paul Woods did with with the with the character of Jason in this book. He just, does he just like hate Friday the Thirteenth? I think he just wrote just hated the assignment. I, I think he wrote, he had a book and found out mm. about this twenty fifth anniversary thing and just shoehorned Jason into it. Mm. Uh, you can hear me during the during my narrative. Copy replace, find yeah. replace. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can you can hear me during this book a couple times as I'm narrating it. Like, jeez, oh my god, a rifle. You know, I didn't even edit it out. I was, it was just so bad. Um, That's funny. It, it was bad. But An audio book with commentary. What is this? Yeah. <laughs> and Josh does so much just fine-tuning editing. If something slips, like, it must have been really bad. Like, you must have had an aneurysm during Death Moon. Oh, yeah. During Death Moon, I stopped and said, guys, I'm not having a stroke. I am reading what's written on the pages. It was just random words for, like, a whole chapter. Just random, nasty, filthy sex stuff about Betty Boop and other people. It, it made no sense. <laughs> look on your and, face. And it, yeah. and it got published. And the editor pushed this book through and let it publish. But, uh, you know, yeah. I wasn't trying to stay on it too long. Um, but the one you were talking about, the cult, that was Church of the Divine Psychopath. Mm-hmm. That was decent. Yeah, it was decent. Uh, it was yeah. pretty filthy, though. That was probably that one was pretty filthy. <laughs> I gotta read. I mean, I feel bad because I've, I've as a big Friday the Thirteenth fan, I've, I haven't read many of the books. Um, I've read I didn't know any of these existed. Uh, They're tough I, to get a hold of now, too. It wasn't like you had Amazon when I was a kid, and I would have bought them all like right away. Like I would have had to find them in a bookstore, and they didn't carry them in any bookstores where I was from. That's why I do what I do, because now the only way to get them is to spend, like, hundreds of dollars. Mm-hmm. Some of these books go for, like, 500 600 bucks, And they're completely awful. <laughs> they are. They're, they're not that great. Uh, a couple of them are pretty good. Like, uh, the Jason String, for instance. Mm-hmm. I, should not, I should not love this book, but I love it. 
That uh, author had to be just one of the best ones out of the ones you've read. She, yeah. Chris Faust, she did a Freddy book, she did a Jason book, and she, she's a phenomenal writer. So yeah. she, she brought so much depth to these characters that was just completely absent in the other ones. You ever seen the uh, movie The Condemned Vincent with Stone Cold Steve Austin? Long time ago, yeah, I, I remember that. This book came out before that, and it is the exact same plot, but with Jason thrown into the reality show with the with the uh, death row inmates fighting on an island to the death. That's pretty cool. See, yeah. I mean, <laughs> and they say there aren't any ideas for Friday the Thirteenth. You kidding me? People would line up to watch that, even if yes. it was silly. There were actually two carnival ones. One <laughs> of the young adult novels mm -hmm. had a carnival in Crystal Lake, but then the one. Uh, Carnival, was it Carnival of Maniacs? Yeah, yeah. That, that was one was interesting. That one had cannibals who tried to eat Jason. It had, um, you know... Rock stars who worship Jason. Yeah, Jason killed somebody with his hockey mask. I didn't think that was possible. But like you said, are there, are there any original kills? He did it with his mask. That was Not amazing. The mask and they were selling Jason's body on, like, an eBay website. Because uh, uh, it was... Uh, it That's funny. Live. Uh, Pamela's head would bring him back to life. It, these That's, books... See, I like stuff like that. I like when people start, like, it's always interesting to me when someone dives back into the mythology that is there and kind of left untapped. Like, what do, what powers does Pamela's head have? What, uh, you know, these types of, like, it's, it's funny. Like, I've never been a huge fan of, like, what Jason Goes to Hell did, where Jason was a pop culture icon when within his own world. It was a bit meta. Right. Um, I just feel like Jason, like Jason is something that can't be explained. And even when the police are filing the reports, they don't know what to write down because at the end of every movie, Jason disappears. There is right. no Jason. You know what I mean? So um, even though at the end of part six, he's like right off the end of the dock and they can't find him. <laughs> but overlooking that, because I think what it, my theory for that is, is that Tommy said, Jason is out there in the water. I chained him to the bottom of the lake. And somebody was like, okay, like deputies, go out there and dive down there and go confirm that. And they both looked at each other and said, you want to just say we dove down there and didn't find anything? Yeah. <laughs> it never went. And so I think that, like, for me, Jason is best utilized when he is this force of nature that can't be captured or found. And that's what makes him so dangerous. And, you know, we one of the things I like to explore in the Never Hike stuff is kind of like, how is Jason, now that we've gotten past the movies, and... We're in this world where Jason has been existing but hasn't popped up in all these years because it, it's kind of like a, uh, it's like a metaphor for real life and the fact that we haven't had any movies. So if we haven't had any movies and it's been that long, it's that Jason's been able to remain unseen, get away with what he's doing because there's been no one able to survive to tell the tale of what's happened to them. Um, and so it's a lot about what kind of I explore in, in Never Hike Alone is about how Jason is able to remain hidden from the world and what lengths does he go to, to do that. Well, it's interesting you say that because uh, you, you said earlier that the goal of making a new film is to improve upon these films. And there were so many scenes in this movie I thought were improvements. Normally, when someone gets stabbed, they're just, oh, dear, and they just carry it on. But this character was like, he, he was self-repairing uh, himself, and mm -hmm. he was hiding, and he was very... Yeah, he was resourceful. He was exactly. aware. He was, you know, the whole point was to create a, a, an antagonist or a protagonist that wasn't a, a pushover. It wasn't right. like the countless number of victims that Jason has had in the past. It is the version of the final girl that won't go down. It's just that this is the only person that's out there. So what happens when somebody is aware, when somebody is equipped to fight, when someone's strong enough to fight? They're not going to beat Jason one-on-one, -on -one, but there are ways to avoid getting killed is ultimately right. there. It's like you're not going to defeat him, but you're going to at least do it enough so you can get away. And the story can continue on. And so that was really kind of the focus to see someone like really fight for their life. See some of see, but it, it, you know, it's also a metaphor for just hiking in general or going out into nature. It's like, it's you versus nature. It's like, you know, there's a, there's a book in a film called walkabout, but in the book they talk about uh, the Aborigine boy who is leading these two kids from South Carolina or from wherever, uh, across the desert plains is that like the difference between life and death between these two people it's like the people from the city they don't think about life and death every day because everything's provided for them but every day out on the plain this aborigine boy like 
every day is a fight against death. He has to find his own food. He has to find his own water. He has to make it cross traversing landscapes. He's got to face off against animals that could come in and try to kill him. He is, he is just as much prey as he is a predator. And so all these things. And so when you're writing a story about survival in nature, you want to have that kind of as a, as a reflection of what our character was going through. So in this instance, our, Kyle of Kyle, our character of Kyle McLeod was going through a journey through nature, and Jason is just the metaphor and symbolism for nature trying to kill him, uh, going off into the woods alone. You know that You know that before this movie came out, there was some killer who was planning on going on a killing spree just killing people that hike alone, and he's like, well, there goes that, you know. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Vincent DeSanti. Sure. Yeah, I'm surprised he hasn't showed up on my doorstep yet. <laughs> you ruined it! No, I, I, I like the trade-off, you know. Uh, this guy fighting, fighting for his life uh, instead of uh, a kill every five seconds, you know. Mm-hmm. It, it seem, it's more realistic. I mean, I, I do enjoy good slasher movie kills, but, you know, it, it makes it get you more invested um, yeah and then when you're you know because i was working with a budget i was working with a small crew i only had one actor attached it wasn't like i mean you could do this movie with three or four actors you know what i mean a group of people walk to the camp and find it and discover it uh friday the 13th 3d the one that they were going to make in 2016 kind of had that they were but they went across the lake and they explored the camp and then they came back and jason followed them um but when you can't bring back actors every weekend and you can't get multiple people to commit, you can only work with what you have. But the thought about doing a, like 127 hours meets Friday the 13th um, was something that I knew that we could do as a group. And so we just try to build the best story off of that as possible and think about the things of like, okay, so if we're eliminating nudity and we're eliminating multiple kills and we're taking all these things away, well, if we're taking something off the wall, we have to put something back on the wall that replaces it as far as cinematic entertainment value. So... We don't get a lot of nudity and kills, but we replace it with actually taking the time to walk around and look at Camp Crystal Lake. Create yes. Camp Crystal Lake as a character and bring it into the story to show that like this place is still here. Um, it's been forgotten about. Let's let's take a trip down memory lane. Let's as fans and, and people who are who are very close to the franchise, let's make them feel like they're they're being given a guided tour through one of the most favorite cinematic uh, environments. And so that was kind of part of the appeal. And then the other part to replace the kills was about stunts. It was about coming up with stunts and gags that may injure our character or may put our character's life in danger. Where in previous films, it would have killed somebody. Our character is going to survive it, dodge it, or just straight up, you know, barely survive it. But he's going to keep pushing on. And so we just keep raising the stakes. Like we, you know, we have him directly fight Jason. We have him thrown off of a second story balcony. The Max is swung at him. He's almost stabbed. He's, you know, he is stabbed and all these different things. But showing that, like, in the previous films, these scenes would have ended with a kill. It's just that our character was able to squirm out of all of the, you know, whatever it is, like five or six versions of kills to finally escape from him rather than succumb to one of those, which, you know, let's think about it. Like, back in the 80s, the, the, the formula for a kill was set up the killers in the room, character turns around, they see a blade, they don't move, they just stare at the blade and scream for two seconds, and then an axe hits them in the face. And you're kind of sitting there like, why didn't you, like, push them, punch them, kick them, like, run? You know what I mean? So I think that, like, this movie is for those, if anybody's ever watched a horror movie and said, why don't they fight back? This movie is for you. This is about how you fight back against a killer and how even, and what makes it so great is, even when you fight back, even when you do everything right, you still cannot quite overcome it. And I think that that's what makes it the an exhilarating thrill ride is the fact that, we don't have a stupid character. We have a very smart character who makes the best decisions that he can um, under the circumstances. So, yeah, I mean, we get a lot of flack for him returning to the camp, but we tried to set something up in the story in which, because he's injured and because he doesn't have any of his gear, retracing his steps through the forest back to where he came from is a death sentence. It doesn't matter if Jason catches up to or not. He's going to get infected. He's eventually going to have a go into shock or something else is going to kill him out there because there's coyotes and other dangerous animals. Um, if he can get to his pack, he can clean himself up. He knows that he's got the skills to avoid Jason if he stays quiet because he knows the dynamic of like, okay, here's this big dude who makes noise wherever he goes. Like, I'm going to be able to hear him coming. Um, 
I can do this. I have the skills to get in and get out. And then I think I can figure out my way out of here. But again, he doesn't have his maps. He doesn't have, he has no clue where he is as far as which direction to go, which is the closest to safety. So he has to return to that, that package of information and that safety equipment so he can repair himself and get out there. It's just that by the time he gets done, once again, Jason steps in his path and it becomes, can he overcome the monster to get to where he wants to go? I think we all would like to believe that we would be that character, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, when most of us would probably be the first person to die in a horror movie. But I you know, I think that's what people uh, to that character so much because they want to be that if that happens to them, you know, something like that. They want to believe that they would put up that kind of fight <laughs> and yeah. uh, want to survive like that. So it makes it more real in a in a sense, um, which really helps invest the uh, viewer into it more now the the ending of the movie how did you pull off that little uh scenario um, so if you haven't watched the movie i'm just gonna give you a quick warning this is a spoiler alert if you haven't watched the movie you can pause this you can go watch the movie it's only 54 minutes then you can come back and you'll hear this cool story be a link uh, in the description yeah so what ended up happening was is we had been making the film for a while. We started in May of 2016. Even prior to that, setting it up, we shot our first trailer. Um, and then we raised a little bit of money, uh, not through Kickstarter, through privately. And then we shot through all, all fall of 2016. Halfway through, we had met uh, an executive producer by the name of Barry J, who became a very good friend of ours and helped us with production and was one of the people who financially backed us without any Kickstarter or any of that, just kind of came in. Uh, when we got halfway through filming and I had half the film shot and half the film cut, um, we started working on a second trailer so we could actually do a crowdfunding campaign. And Barry called me up one day and said, hey, Vinny, how would you feel about if we could get Tom Matthews in the film? And I just like laughed at him. Um, and I said, that'd be like my dream come true. My whole idea with this is that at the end of this movie that. Tom's character, we would bring him into the next story. Let's say we do like Never Hike Alone Well, I'll go approach Tom and see if he wants to be in Never Hike Alone 2. Uh, the original premise actually had uh, the character of Kyle McCloud dying. So we were going to have his brother return and have Tom seek out Tom to help him go find his brother who ends up being dead. Um, so what ended up happening was is that Barry jokingly was like, well, that's funny because I'm going to go out to dinner with Tom next week for my birthday. A friend of mine knew him as a mutual acquaintance and as a birthday present to me, they set me up on this dinner date with Tom and his wife and me and my partner are going to go out and meet them. We're going to have some good time. I'm going to tell him about Never Hike Alone. I'll see if he's interested in being in it. And I was just kind of like, he's never going to want to do this. Um, Barry pitched it to Tom. Uh, Tom kind of graciously said, oh, that sounds like fun and kind of just said thanks but no thanks in a way uh but somehow barry convinced him to come out and meet me um and just at least hear me out and so uh about a week and a half later i sat down with tom and barry we were at a restaurant in los angeles and i kind of described to tommy uh, to tom what we had been doing uh how much we had shot and then he had seen the other trailer he thought it was very impressive. He liked the drone work and some of the other things. But it, there wasn't much there. It was just kind of like, it looked a little silly, like this guy with this tiny knife fighting Jason. Uh, well, then we had the second trailer, and that was done. And we hadn't released it yet. We were waiting for Friday the 13th in January. So I showed him that trailer. And that was a completely different thing. That was filled with stunts and big lighting setups and big stunt setups. And, and you got to see more of Jason. You got to see the new mask. Um, just overall scope and scale, it seemed like it was a bigger film uh, than, than what we had originally kind of led people on. And that was kind of the appeal of it. And so t at that moment, Tom was like, wow, this sounds really interesting. How do you see me getting involved? And I said, well, I have this idea for a scene at the end of the film in which an ambulance shows up to pick up this character and then Jason shows up and kills everybody. Um, but what if Tommy was the driver? I was like, doesn't that make sense? I mean, Tommy became a paramedic and... You know, this is how he makes a living. He became an EMT. Uh, it's basically one of the only jobs he can do in Crystal Lake. Um, and it keeps his finger on the pulse. You know, he's very good at, at going into dangerous situations and not flinching because he's seen the most dangerous things in the world. And so him running into a burning building really isn't a, doesn't even have to have a thought. Like, he doesn't care how much he really cares about his own life. Probably not that much. You know, if he gets killed in this fire, like, phew, that's going to relieve him of all, of all this pain the curse has put on him. Um, so it made sense for him to take up that role. We talked about that. And then we discussed whether it would be Tommy or not. 
uh, he was like, we should use, Tom- if you got Tommy, let's use Tommy. So we had to change the ending so he didn't get killed because at that point I would be dead right now because <laughs> fans would have sought me out and killed me. Um, and we went back and forth on a couple of ways to end it. Uh, there was obviously nobody dies, which then fans still would have been very upset if I didn't get any kills in there. Um, and then we came up with the idea that, like, we see Tommy get pulled out, but we just don't see what happens to him. So anything could happen to him. He could still be alive, which means he can get back in the car and he could drive away. So once we kind of came up with that sense that, like, Tommy's out there. He hasn't seen Jason in a long time. This is a fishy situation. And then he finally sees Jason. He goes to fight him. Um, he doesn't get to do it right in this moment. He kind of gets over overwhelmed. His fellow... Uh, EMTs get killed, but he's able to get back in the van, save this guy's life, and drive away and regroup and open up kind of the door for more story to be told. Because where does it go from here? And I think that that's one of the cool things about the ending of Never Hike Alone because it shows that, like, not only did we show and prove to a lot of people, uh, hopefully the studios to a certain degree, that there are still stories about Friday the 13th that can be told, that can be successful, that can be entertaining. But there's not only one, there's multiple. And there's and within this franchise alone, there are many more films that I could make off of this if I had the proper funding. Um, we're going to crowdfund and make more. We obviously just shot, we funded and, and shot a prequel because it was self-contained and we were able to kind of do it and bring to life the idea that fans always wanted to see Jason in the snow. So we thought we'd tackle that one um, to help set up what we want to do with the later installments. But we have a lot to figure out and we kind of want to have a serious conversation with people about Never Hike Alone, where it stands in Friday the 13th and how maybe going to a little bit more professional route would be the proper, the proper thing for this because it probably does require that type of funding. But at the same time, it's a story that I think fans would gravitate towards the way they do to never hike alone and see this as maybe the ending we deserved a long time ago and never received. And that's the way I want to approach it and say, okay, without getting too silly, without trying to do anything too, um, it's not like a, a gimmick. You know what I mean? Like Jason versus Carrie or Jason in Manhattan or like all the things they did that were gimmicky ways of like, ending the franchise that we we dismiss all the gimmicks and we actually go back to the roots of the franchise about the curse about jason about tommy and this town and it all coming to a final head of where after all these years after you know all these questions about all this stuff that jason can finally be put to rest um and the people of crystal lake can can live at ease and tommy can live at ease whatever his fate is going to be knowing or kind of getting to a point of like here's how we're going to do it and you know, the story of Kyle McLeod grew from its original premise, obviously, from him going from somebody who was just going to go into the forest and die to actually this Luke Skywalker type character who is being sucked into a story that he doesn't know is much greater than himself. When he out of the other side and him and Tommy have to team up in order to face this challenge that he's about to learn a lot of truths about what's going on here that he had no clue of. And I think even fans to a certain degree. So What's nice is that Kyle acts as our babe in the woods who doesn't know anything. And obviously Tommy's had 20 more years in between the other films to kind of gain more knowledge. So we have this character that we can have Tommy feed knowledge about what he's experienced, about what he's going through, but that are going to directly tie into previous films that there are something we can call back to. So like with Jason showing up in the ambulance at the end of the film, that's a very direct callback to part five. Jason showing up in the hospital at the end of Tommy's bed as an illusion. And to think, like you guys were talking about before, one concept that I love is the, the fact that Jason's essence can reach out, that the curse of Camp Crystal Lake can reach out, and, t- and the people who have come in contact with it, who have survived it, they live with it for the rest of their lives, so they dream of Jason. They have haunting memories, and they see visions of Jason. Um, and everybody deals with it in a different way, and Tommy's way of dealing with it is by being the town's protector. But imagine, like looking for an itch you can never scratch you can never quite find it if you know it's out there you know it's doing something you know it's creating havoc but you can't find it and stop it so that's kind of tommy's curse and what he's been doing for all these years and it's wore him down that's why at the end of the movie he's not really like i gotta go find jason i gotta go do these things it's more about like oh like just a this doesn't feel right but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna let the curse trick me this time Jason isn't out here. He's dead. I, I killed him a long time ago. He would have been like if, if Jason was here, he would have been here already type thing. Um, and some of the stuff we do in Never Hike in the Snow is going to, I hope, allow people to see why Tommy has backed off a little bit um, and to see how Tommy's 
the mode of thinking has gotten him into trouble in the past with things and, and how it's gotten other people into trouble in the past. So he's, he's kind of taking a safer approach and just trying to live his life. Um, and then, and also that Kyle, even though he survived this one night with never hike alone, um, that it's not over that. Yes. He may have gotten out of that situation. Yes. He may be at the hospital. He may feel safe, but he's not safe. And that if he doesn't do anything about it, eventually Jason's going to get him in one way or another. And it's Kyle coming to the realization that this is going to happen and that he has to put his life back on the line to kind of fix the mistake that he made. Because after all these years, Jason has been missing. Jason's missing. He hasn't been drawn out of the camp. The actions that Kyle has on the night that Never Hike Alone happens lead to Jason revealing himself to the world for the first time in 30 years. And that's where the next story goes is him is this unfolding of events of here's the chain reaction. The town has been scared of happening for 30 years that someone was going to go in, poke the bear is going to wake up. And now it's just devastation in the wake. And who's going to put, you know, who's going to put the plug in the dam? Is it going to be Tommy? Is it going to be Kyle? Is it going to be the sheriff? Is it going to be someone else in town? So it, it's kind of like, it's all up in the air at this point. And we're trying to, at the beginning of the series now, introduce all these characters who are going to play a factor in the outcome of the final, the final confrontation and the types of relationships they each have with Jason um, and how that reflects back on the, on the franchise and all these different things. So there's a lot of really cool story that's underneath it. And then on top of it, it's a bunch of cool action, a lot of cool set pieces, um, and overall, I think it's just this nice, satisfying, like, ah, I can live with this ending type deal for, for Friday the 13th. Awesome. Uh, like, I can't wait for Never Hike in the Snow. Um, you mentioned that it's a prequel, mm-hmm. but it, is it going to have, I know you can't say much, uh, is it, is the whole thing a prequel? Or is there like a chance that there could be like a little part of the movie, maybe at the end? or something that gives us a little bit of information about what happened after the first one. You know, a uh, part of me, um, there's a very key scene that I've been wanting to do for a long time that belongs in the third installment called Never Hike Again. Uh-huh. I did want to try and film that this summer, but I don't have the means to do it because of COVID and things like that. I probably would have tagged that on to the end of Never Hike in the Snow. Okay. Never Hike in the Snow takes entirely before Never Hike Alone. It takes three, three months before Never Hike Alone. You're going to meet some characters that lived in town, Um, their experience and what happened to them. And then when you're watching Never Hike, the next installments, as some of these other characters start to show up again, you understand their backstory. More than anything, Never Hike in the Snow is about Jason. It's a lot about Jason. It's a lot. It's kind of like an extension of the music video that we did called Disappear, where it's, you know, Jason's place is disturbed. He takes action and it's kind of this cycle of a curse that he's in. And so we see a little bit about how the the curse affects Jason, what he goes through, why he kills people to a certain degree or what he's trying to protect. And then kind of the chaos that he creates around him. And because there's so much chaos around him, it almost helps him stay hidden. Um, and so it's a lot about that. And it's a lot about, uh, the film's a lot about loss, about losing somebody, making every kill count. So our deaths in this, again, do not throw people off the trail and, and, and give them expectations that aren't there. There aren't a lot of deaths in, in Never Hike in the Snow because we wanted to focus on a few characters that when they did die, you wanted to feel for them. Yeah. Um, and so we spent more time establishing character, making their deaths extremely brutal and horrible. So you're like, not only do you feel for this person, uh, but now they're going through a very horrible death and the effects are really, really cool. So we wanted to kind of use that and then in between do what we did before. We set up these things about Friday the 13th that you never knew were things that could be explored by these by these films that when you actually did explore it um, actually elevates them and brings them into a new type of, of filmmaking rather than just this the straight old cheeseburger, which is just like, you know, scene, death boobs, blood, scene, death, boobs, blood, and and repeat, repeat, repeat till the end until Jason dies. Um, and yeah, there's some harsh truth in this one. There's some cool discoveries along the way. Uh, we, we're trying to incorporate, you know, trying to, trying to world build. You know what I mean? We're building that world around Friday the 13th. And as, as Never Hike Alone was meant to be kind of its own standalone thing, and it, and it is, and it's sprung into a, a bigger piece. Now as we do these installments, they're more like, episodes so you're getting 
some of the story, but you're not getting all of the story. So when this one ends, you're probably going to have questions. Well, what's going to happen next? How's this going to go? And then when we get into the next episode, it's going to be like any episode of television where you move the story a little bit along, you pick up with the characters some time later, um, and you see how everybody starts to come together. And then all the episodes, as they start to come out, you start to realize how everything's connected. And there's pieces that are tied all the way back to Snow and all this stuff. But, <clears throat> I mean, Snow basically came off of me wanting to create something in the snow. The original premise was probably six pages. Um, I just wanted to film a quick short last year, and I couldn't raise the funding for it. So when I raised the funding for this one, um, we were very successful. And it, as I started to kind of think about the scene and think about the characters and think about how I was developing the later scripts, I was like, there's a lot more story to be told here. Um, and the original simple premise, which was basically just like a hunter going out and getting killed, uh, I changed it all around, you know, changed it to a young boy who is not a young boy, like he's 12, but he's like a, a teenager in high school who's out in the woods who goes missing. So what's it like in Crystal Lake when somebody goes missing in the forest? Like what, how do people handle it? So we wanted to play up with that type of theme and then break it off from there. So it's a little bit of like a police drama because we're watching the police investigate, um, and then we're seeing how they're handling it and we're obviously seeing how Tommy's reacting to it because Tommy doesn't know at this point either. I mean, even in this film, he can't quite confirm whether it's going to be Jason or not because somebody goes missing, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything to, to Tommy. It's automatically Jason to everyone else. They want to come up with the excuse that it's something else. So they don't have to think about Jason still being out there. So there's a, there's kind of a, a, a dynamic that gets weighed between my mind on snow i'll take it um i made a couple notes here of mm -hmm. things i wanted to bring up to you uh sean if, is, is it cool if i go through these real quick yeah go ahead okay you were talking about jason's conclusive ending uh, eventually um i gotta share something with you guys i've never told sean about this i had a dream about 10 years ago that i always wanted to turn into like a short uh, if possible, and I was dreaming, I was having a Jason dream, right, and it was me versus Jason, and it was almost, it was like uh, the Pamela and Alice scene from the end of the original Friday the 13th. Where Jason's the, like shoving your head into the sand? We're like <laughs> on the beach and everything, and I end up giving Jason the same death that, that Pamela got, hmm. chopping his head off, and I think that's it, and his hands go up like Pamela's did, but he's still got a machete. With his head gone before he dies, he killed me. Oh. Had, and then he was dead. It was his end. But it, And I always thought that would be like a cool scene to see, you know, mm. like Jason gets Pamela's death. And even and right before he's done, on his way down, ends up killing the person that, uh, that mm. killed him. So when you were talking about that, that I remember that's something I've been wanting to share with Sean. Uh, I mean, you always could film that. I mean, someone on YouTube filmed Michael Myers' death. I think it was six or seven minutes long. It was a really thought-provoking piece, but, it, I mean, it was it was a short film. They didn't need to be longer than that, so you always could as a thought piece. Um, I just, I really just thought it would be karmic, you know, full circle. Jason goes out the same way his mom did, you know, the way he saw his mom go out. Um, a connection I made while watching Never Hike Alone uh, the first time was I always thought your, uh, your protagonist in it is what Rob from part four should have been. Yeah. You know, because yeah. they set Rob up to be like a badass guy that's going to go up against Jason, and it's just, yeah, he's taking out in the basement. Me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they could have even had the same fate, you know what I mean? He could have still died. They could have given him a fight. He could have at least no, fought back a little bit. You know, I'm even like, a false victory. Like, I don't know. It's just yeah. so funny to have that hype, and then he just gets knocked out in three seconds. <laughs> And he, and he gets the the funniest, you know. It's like buying, he's he's buying a UFC pay per view. Um, I don't. I'm gonna check out that music video. I have not seen that yet. Yeah, uh, that's on our that's on our YouTube channel. Um, definitely. I, I don't know how I missed that. Um, I wanted to touch on the connections between uh, Jason Lives and uh, Never and and Never Hike Alone, mm -hmm. uh, but. Real quick, I've got to refer this one to you because earlier you were talking about Jason being a force of nature in a way. And I think that Sean would agree with me on this, that Hate, Kill, Repeat mm. yeah. is a book 
uh, that kind of tackles that, especially uh, a scene at the end that takes place at this motel, um, a uh, big hotel. <clears throat> but yeah, Hate, Kill, Repeat. If you ever have a chance to read that one or listen to my audio book of it, whichever, uh, I think you would enjoy the way that Jason's handled in that book. Mm -hmm. And it's it's an alternate part eight. It picks up at the cool. end of part seven, and it even ends setting. But doesn't Hate Kill Repeat have uh, Jason X Jason on it? No, no. No. What's no. on the cover of Hate Kill Repeat? For some reason, they did a photo shoot with Kane Hodder's part ten Jason. He oh, is yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So you got yeah, me got me mixed it's up. Pre it's pre pre Uber Jason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got him on there. But that was just marketing. It's, yeah, it's that was marketing because they had the stills from from New Line that they that they were licensed. Okay, the, oh, like wow, it was like that's the same really... Jason. Sometimes he'd be like this. Sometimes he'd be like this. They were just like <laughs> yeah. different shots and different kills, but completely different Jasons. In He's the just movie. like swinging the chain. Yeah, and then <laughs> Jason, and then the Jason strain like a bow used. Uh, Freddie uses uh, Ken Kurzinger, Freddy versus Jason's Jason. Mm -hmm. it, 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 there's no connection. Uh, but yeah, the, it, the marketing departments aren't really the the kindest of Friday the Thirteenth. They just seem to grab anything and throw it on without thinking about it. I mean, how many covers of how many Friday the Thirteenth DVD books, whatever, have the wrong Jason on them? <laughs> have Jason on the mask. cover of Friday the Thirteenth, which he's not even in uh, as an adult, and they have a hockey mask on the on. The, you know, it's just like one of those things. I'm like, who is? Who is who is directing this this stuff? Because they're not they're not paying attention. I got one for you. There's a Jason X book called Planet of the Beast, mm -hmm. and the cover is like an up-close thing of Uber Jason with his bright red eyes, and in the entire book, the author talks about how, how his eyes are ice blue. And it's, you well, know, it's that. like right there on the cover. They call him Jason X. They're like, we caught the oh, Jason X. They called him Jason X in the whole book. That was, that's what they call, that's what they said. We his caught name. the Jason X. They and he, he, run, X. he runs down hallways, he has blue eyes, and his name is Jason X. That's funny. <laughs> um, oh, maybe yeah. Roy took him over. Yeah. There we Reverse go. Reverse engineer. <laughs> the thing Roy's is, turn. the Jason X books except for part four. I think in After the Slash, I'll go into more detail about that. Uh, but they're fun. They're not... They're, they're kind of like the movie. They're, they don't take themselves seriously, and they're just fun. Um, part four is god-awful. The other ones are readable. But yeah, Hate, Kill, Repeat, please check that one out if you ever get a chance, because I would love to pick your brain on that book after you hear it or read it. Um, but yeah, I want to, to get to the part six... Uh, I've always separated the movies into three <laughs> sections. That's one through four, uh, you know, uh, six, seven, eight, and then nine and ten. Okay, uh, I thought one through four was its own kind of set, and I love the I love part four. It's one of my favorites. Uh, part six, we get the whole undead Jason, mm -hmm. which I always thought it was kind of cool that that dream that Tommy's having at the beginning of part five. It's kind of a foreshadow of how he actually brings Jason back later. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so you read the book Jason Lives, and you told me that there was a couple key scenes from the book that had you going, wow, you know, like uh, as far as like your work with Never Hike Alone. And I would love to hear that, if you don't mind, uh, what those scenes were. Yeah, so what, what was pretty cool was... Um... You know, when you read these books, you, you end up traveling through a lot of um, description and lines that you know. I mean, you're basically, you can see the movie in your head as you're watching it because you know where it's coming from. And, and it's still coming off, and some of it's inspired by Tom McLaughlin's script. I thought it was pretty funny that some of the lines are a little bit different. Like, he doesn't say where the red dot go, you bang. It's like, wherever the red dot go, the bullet follows. Like, there's things like that. I, I liked, um, what was the other one that was kind of funny? Uh, Sheriff Garris refers to... Uh, uh, Forest Green as it's being named after a damn crayon, which I thought was a good good line. But one of the thing, cool things that happens is that it stops and pauses on a character for a moment. So in these moments in the films where Jason's just walking through the forest, Simon Hawk has taken these moments that are just literally five seconds on screen and turned them into two, three page parag uh, of paragraphs yeah. describing what's going on in Jason's head while he's walking through the forest, the things that he's having memories of. Um, and one of the things that I really loved about it was talking about like, and I apologize because I live near a uh, a fire station. I'll I just I'm surprised. Yeah, so. To me. <laughs> um, one of the things that I found cool was that he went into Jason's kind of headspace a little bit, thinking about how 
he can't explain everything that's happening to him that he's a little bit confused by what's going on just as about anybody else is that like he's died but now that he's resurrected like even in the coffin like as the maggots were eating him they couldn't digest him um when he was a young boy and people tried to pick on him or do anything to them bad things would happen to them that he's always had this kind of like extra weight kind of with him that that he hasn't been able to tell or deal with and he's kind of innocent too in a way um and i just thought it was just so interesting in the way that that you know it's kind of the, the way that i kind of approached jason in in my films was that i wanted to tap back into the mentality of him as a 12 year old boy and coming to terms with what he is why he is and how long is he going to keep doing this and why and why does he keep doing this but ultimately it comes back down to his mother um, and they do this in the book. They talk about how he remember. Like I think they talk about it very specifically. He rem- as he's coming up on on Crystal Lake, he has flashbacks to the memories of still being underwater, seeing his mom die. Um, one of the things I like about this the books and what Simon Hawk does is he doesn't he doesn't uh, he doesn't really give any credence to the the notion that Jason never drowned, um, which is something that some fans try to say, and some of the fans kind and some of the films kind of dance around. But in here, I mean, it's very much explicitly said that Jason drowned in 1957 uh, and he did die and that it was the process of his mother dying that brought him back from the dead and and has put him on this kind of cursed path to forever be this walking act of vengeance that um, that curses this land and protects this land Uh, and how, you know, I always talk about like in the films, Jason is constantly up and down. He talks about that in a little bit about how Jason re- receives a, f- a fatal blow, but as soon as he sees he receives the fatal blow, he already starts to regenerate. He already starts to heal. Um, he starts to come together. He talks about like Jason walking through the forest. That Jason and now hours, you know, twelve or so or sixteen hours after he's been risen from the grave, is starting to feel his body come back together stronger than it was. Um, now that the the electricity had kind of woken back up, so there's really cool. Um, insights into as far as like the mechanism of what Jason was and, and what keeps him ticking and it all centers around the curse and that's what I really love about it is the fact that they that's the theme of, of the original movie and if you can keep the theme of the original movie you keep that that sense of the curse kind of permeating its way through Jason through the town through everything that he touches and everything that he does that is I think one of the most interesting things Friday the 13th has going for it that hasn't necessarily been explored openly in films there's actually a point where you said something about Tommy's curse, and I'm thinking that could be Never Hike Alone Five, Tommy's curse. You know, just now now they're starting to have subtitles. Yeah, right. There was a couple. There was a couple pinpoints you were talking about that would have made like really cool titles, like uh, Never Never Hike Alone Six, Force of yeah. Nature, or something. Right. Well, I mean, it, it, the nice thing that I'm really looking forward to is like once we start moving on to the next installment in the series, Never Hike Again, we go into Tommy's curse. Uh, Never Hike Again is all about Tommy. So, you know, never in Never Hike Alone, he shows up at the end of the movie. In Never Hike in the Snow, he's there. He has, you know, he has major scenes, but it's not necessarily quite his story yet. That's one thing I got to get fans ready for is like, listen, Tommy's in it. He has some really cool stuff. He does some cool things, but this isn't necessarily his story yet. He's there as a character in the town. He shows up. He does some things. Rick is there as a character. It's kind of it's, it's his story a little bit because he's trying to carry the investigation and Tommy's kind of a pain in his ass. Um, but it's really about the characters that are kind of surrounding it too, who are a little bit new to the situation and trying to figure out what's going on. Um, it is really until Never Hike Again that Tommy takes over as the main protagonist, and we see everything from his perspective. And Never Hike Again picks up with um, Tommy the morning of finding Kyle McLeod that night. So we see his life before he gets confirmation that. I mean, true blue confirmation that Jason is there and he is contacting and ready to fight him. Um, Like, what's going on and what he deals with on an everyday basis and how that affects him and how that kind of builds his character and how other people see them and then to see it all kind of come to a head where we see how he finds Kyle, we see what happens outside the van, like how what happens when he fought Jason and then we see what happens a little bit afterwards to see okay, now that he's kind of had this moment in Never Hike Alone, how does he really choose to fight Jason in this moment and kind of bring it to there, uh, which is more of like the... It's like a, it's almost... I consider Never Hike Again to be the Back to the Future 2 of Never Hike Alone, where it's like this story that plays at the same time as the other film, so you kind of crisscross in and out of the, the timelines, and you see where these characters almost cross paths in a few places, um, but that ultimately they kind of both end in the same place. 
uh, they end in the same period of time. It's the, you know, in Back to the Future 2, they both really end when, you know, Doc sends Marty back to the future. Um, and in this one, it, it also ends with them driving into town. It just shows you a little bit more of what happens afterwards. Um, because I'm, Tommy I'm just, with you. yeah. I'm with, you as, I'm with you as long as Pamela doesn't try to hit on Jason. Yeah, and, Pamela uh, will not be hitting on Jason. Okay, uh, okay. Then, yeah, but you'll get some cool things. And then, and then from there, it kind of goes into uh, then Jason on his rampage back. And that's when we have to really raise some real money for that. But uh, until then, we have like, it's all really based on character stories. And I think that it's different for Friday the 13th. Um, character, like character is not a huge uh, pull in Friday the 13th. Well, as far as like telling stories about actual characters, it's just about getting them out there and killing them. So I think this is for me, it's like, that's my niche. That's where I'm kind of staking my ground is like, I'm doing character stories. Yeah. Jason happens to be a part of this huge character story, but ultimately it's about these characters, not necessarily about being a Friday the 13th film. Yeah. Cause you know, I've always thought it's weird that we never got a 13th official, you know, the fact that they're on 13, do you think they would have done something with that? They've been but, trying. Yeah. You know, um, they, they, they're four films deep on, on, on getting shut down. They, they Tom's tried to make writing, Tom's apparently writing another script too. Uh, uh, Tom McLaughlin is, yeah, I think um, he did the death of Jason Voorhees or yeah. Uh, he's yeah. going to tell us about it in a couple of weeks. He's going to come on and Great. talk about it a little bit. Um, Supposedly, a, they did have a script for that 13th one. I can talk about that when you're done with this. Oh, wait. Yeah, I was just going to say it's an amazing time to be a Jason fan right now, Friday the 13th fan. Uh, there's so many amazing fan films that are happening. Um, Never Hike Alone was my first that I really got behind and, uh, you know, talked about on my channel when I first started out. Uh, first one I really watched and really enjoyed. Um it's just it's just an awesome time, and you're building up this whole franchise within a franchise. I mean, that's just a, fans should be excited about this. I'm excited. I didn't know any of this, yeah. uh, all this extra stuff, and you got <clears throat> me uh, wanting to have my own DeLorean right now and going to the future. Um, have me you too. Can I just go? At, I want to be like Bill and Ted and go back to where I've already written the song that saves the world. So I kind of just go to there and just go grab that, bring it back, and show everybody. Because uh, oh, it's going to be a lot of hard work in between. But no, I mean, it's not just us, too. I mean, there are lots of other good uh, filmmakers out there who are making stuff. I'm helping out a team in Portland, uh, James Sweet and Carl Winery for Jason Rising. There's Fall I Can't Blood from the Slash and Crass guys. That uh, Vengeance had come out last year. There's another one called Voorhees coming out. Um, what else? Uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. I've heard a couple more. His name was Jason. There's lots of people out there really, really doing a lot. So, um in the absence of the studios being able to do anything and the lawsuit keeping everybody from making anything, fans have stepped up and we were just started entertaining ourselves. I mean, yeah. that's, the, that's the thing. I'm, I, I very much enjoy these movies. Never Hike Alone blew me away. Um, <laughs> a, a, a lot of these are just fantastic, but the problem is when I try to tell people about them, they hear fan film and they immediately stop listening to anything I'm saying afterward. Like, they'll go, oh, oh, I'll watch it. And I'm sure in their head, yeah, I'll watch it. <laughs> You know, just yeah, like, like YouTube. I, would, I wish they would see one of these so they could see how far these could go. The imagination, mm -hmm. the passion put into this, just utterly fantastic. Better than a lot of the movies in the actual franchise. And it's just, for I'll some say reason, it's not in theaters. There's like a stigma on it. I said this about Vengeance when I talked to Jason Brooks, and I'll say it to you. I will take Never Hike Alone over Manhattan. I will take Never Hike Alone over Part 3. Uh, in my in my honest opinion, it is better than those actual Friday the Thirteenth licensed official movies. It really Absolutely. is. And uh, Vengeance, I really enjoyed it too. I um, and and I'm gonna ask this of everybody that's worked on a fan film. I did it with Jason. I'll do it with uh, with a uh, guy I'm talking to from uh, the Voorhees movies um, from the Voorhees movie. Jason, there's this there's this big thing about would Jason kill an innocent, uh, a dog, uh, you know, because Kane talked about how he didn't think Jason would kill a dog or a child because uh, he resonates with innocence, you know. What's your take on that? There is Jason the boy, and there is Jason the curse. Would Jason the boy harm anyone? And that answer is no. I think that deep down, Jason really doesn't want to kill anybody. It's not, it's not his decision to do it. He is enacting, he is basically 
bringing forth what his mother brought to the table, this madness, this rage, this needing of revenge, and this guilt, because he feels guilty. Uh, he feels guilty for drowning. He feels guilty for leaving his mother alone. He feels guilty for what happened to her. He feels like it's his fault. Even though it wasn't his fault that he drowned, he still kind of wears that guilt. So if Jason kind of has a moment where, and that's what Never Hike Alone is about. If you watch Never Hike Alone and you really study Jason's acting in it and his mentality in it, for the first half of the film, he's quiet. He's a 12-year-old boy hiding in the woods watching somebody do something, making sure they don't get out of line. The moment Kyle steps out of line and he crosses a line, Jason the murderer has to step in and take care of it because he's discovered his mother's head. This is not good. He knows that I'm here. He knows my secret. People are going to come. And if people are going to come, my secret is blown. And this whole oasis that I've created for me and my mother will never be able to, won't be able to continue to exist. And so I feel that Jason kills a lot out of necessity. He also kills a lot out of the curse doing it. So would it be Jason's first choice to kill a child or a dog or anything? No. But if those things, if it's between that thing and his mom, yeah, he's going to kill it. He doesn't care what it is because that's the last person he's going to let down. And so I think that that's the dynamic. And it's, point. you know, it, it, I think it really comes down to, because the more I thought about it, the more I had to write about Jason, the more I had to dive into his head to come up with these ser- scenes to make sure they were motivated correctly, I realized that he died as a 12-year-old boy. He wasn't necessarily an evil person. He never went out of his way to do evil things to anybody. And I know in the Simon Hogg novel, there's a whole section where a kid punched him in the face, and then a day later, the kid took that same hand and shoved it in uh, shoved it in the, the, uh, the dish. What is it? Disposal. The disposal and cuts off his own hand because something happens to him. I don't don't know if – I don't buy into the sense that Jason was evil from the day he was born. My feeling is is this is going off of of an interview with Betsy Palmer when she talks about her inspiration for becoming – Pamela Voorhees, there was, in the first movie, there's – she wears a class ring. That's supposed to give – it's kind of like the old Giallo – trick where you show something on a character that kind of reveals a part of their identity. They never dive into it in the film. It never has anything to do with it, but she's wearing a class ring that's supposed to be the boy she was going steady with who got her pregnant with Jason. And then when she told him that he was pregnant, he said, it's not mine and bailed and left her as a single mother in the 1940s when everybody was really conservative and and there was no having children out of wedlock. So now she's pregnant. She's her parents don't want anything to do with her. And then she gives birth and she gives birth to a hydrocephalic child. So now she's got a deformed child, she's got no father, and everyone just looks at her like she's insane. Like she, this is her punishment for having sex out of wedlock. The devil gave her a little deformed baby. And everybody looks at this kid and thinks it's awful. Look at it. It's got to be bad. Look, it doesn't blink. It doesn't sense pain. It doesn't do any of these things. It's got to be a work of the devil. And really it's just this innocent kid who just wants to make friends with people. And you have this woman who just wished that somebody would accept her for who she is. And eventually she found her way to Camp Crystal Lake. And for the first time in her life, she met people who were a little bit more progressive. She met people who were accepting, who said, please come stay with us. Your child can stay with us. We'll take care of him. We're, we're going to take care of you. You're going to have a place where you feel accepted and you feel wanted and you feel like you, a place you can call home. And we'll take care of you. And then one day, the people who said they were going to take care of her didn't take care of them. Her son died. And when she asked for accountability, no accountability was given. And from there, she was driven to madness and she was driven to kill because all her life she had been shunned and shunned and shunned and shunned. And right when she thought she was accepted and right when she thought everybody cared, when when push came to shove, she see that nobody really cared. It was all fault. It was all to make themselves feel better. It wasn't about making her feel better of doing anything for her child. Their children were more important. They had to go off to school so they couldn't get in trouble for this. They they have scholarships. Like how can you? How dare my son not go to go play lacrosse at Harvard? Like you know. And I, I can imagine that Steve Christie was probably one of those kids. And the and the Christies were the ones protecting their own children. And the people who own that camp, the the hierarchies of our society, were watching out after, after them. So I think that's where ultimately the Friday the 13th lineage comes from. It's a story like that. It's not something where Jason was raped and was a rape baby. He's not some weird supernatural thing. It all comes out of the fact that there was this bond between this mother and the son. And through the trials and tribulations of their lives, this bond grew and grew and grew and grew and grew until they were separated. And that separation created the curse. That's what kind of brought it to life was this love that they shared that turned into something hateful and vengeful but it was so powerful that it has transcended death and it has transcended the earthly realm and so now these spirits with um with with business left undone 
which is making people pay for the wrongs that had been to them, which is a very common horror theme logic throughout all of history. Um, it seems to fit. And I think if you fit it in there, you see that as much as they are uh, killers, they are also victims. And so that is the kind of the duality of Friday the 13th. And I think that that one makes it a little bit more of an interesting character. And I know Jason went on to become a mindless killer that didn't think about what he was doing. But in the sense of going back in, elevating story and elevating character, there is a lot of material there to uh to leap off of and have very solid footing as you're telling a story about a character who is conflicted about the curse that he's been giving as much as everyone else is cursed and being killed he is cursed to carry this out because of the feelings that he has and this this feeling that he has and that his mother had and the wrong that they did so now they're doomed to repeat their mistakes and everyone else is doomed to suffer at the hands of those mistakes so it's kind of a a cool complex story that that has a good heart to it yeah you, that mentality right there that talking about like the inner 12 year old of Jason you know I can kind of see that in the scene in Jason lives where he's kind of staring at Nancy mm -hmm. the little girl because he could have just hacked all those kids to pieces as soon as he walked in mm -hmm. but he hasn't really encountered many little kids and when he looks at her it kind of fits with what you're saying there it's almost like the kid version of him is looking at this kid and mm -hmm. then he sees the the person that's done wrong walking by the window and the curse he's reminded yeah yeah so yeah that that's awesome sean yeah you said you had some things. I'm... what's up you said you had some things written down that you wanted to discuss um most of these i think would be better for the after show um because they're on topic but like i said they're off topic enough mm -hmm. to where i think that it detracts from the central theme that we're trying to tackle here so okay. uh my wrapping thoughts I'll give, I'll give my closing thoughts for this, but then I'll tackle the other stuff in the other section. Okay. Well, I was going to say um, thank you so much, Vincent, for uh, stopping into Out of Print Slashers. Absolutely. Uh, thank and you. Thank you for, uh, um, if you're going to stick around for After the Slash. Um, Definitely. Was there anything else you wanted to plug or talk about before we uh, wrap up the uh, podcast here? No, I guess uh, just a quick plug. Uh, if people aren't already, please follow us at all of our social media accounts, Womp Stomp Films, W-O-M-P-S-T-O-M-P-F-I-L-M-S. We're on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. Instagram is probably where we post the most. We have a lot of behind-the-scenes photos that we're posting from Never Hike in the Snow. Uh, we're in editorial right now, so we'll be doing update posts from editorial. Our YouTube channel, obviously, we have a lot of great content up there. We have Never Hike Alone. We have our behind-the-scenes of Never Hike Alone, which if you watch that, um, you'll get great insight to how the film was made, what we had to go through to make it. It's like it could have been an hour and a half long, but we didn't want a BTS that was longer than the movie. Uh, and then um, obviously we have the Disappear music video. We have a film coming out at some point called Pathosis, which is our first original production uh, directed by a good friend of mine, Austin Boning. It just got into Genre Blast 2020. We played at a few other festivals earlier this year. Um, if anyone would like a Never Hike Alone Blu-ray, they can email me at wompstompfilms at gmail.com. I do have about 150 left, and this is basically it of the third edition. Uh, we just go through PayPal, so if you email me, I can tell you how much it is to ship it to you, and we can just get one out to you. Um, we also have some T-shirts and pins and some posters, uh, and I think that's about it. Just keep an eye out for updates from us. Uh, we got a lot of cool things coming down the line. We have more projects uh, lined up the Never Hike Alone franchise itself, but some original stuff that we're working on. Obviously, we're helping out the guys at Jason Rising. We're co-producing that. We have another Nightmare on Elm Street fan film coming out called Dylan's New Nightmare, where we're working with uh, Cecil Laird from The Horror Show. It's a popular horror YouTube channel, um, which is cool. It's a continuation of Wes Craven's A New Nightmare uh, with now Dylan, Dylan Porter, all grown up, played by Miko Yu's, the same actor who played him, uh, the same actor who played him as a child uh who is now freddie has manifested himself back into reality again by hiding in the cortex of uh of dylan's fears for all these years and now finally having enough energy as as he's an adult and having fears about his own life freddie uses this to then once again bring himself back into the real world and it's a really cool story i'm uh, very happy to be involved um and then yeah, a few other projects on the horizon, but we got a lot of stuff coming out, and we want to just keep flooding uh, YouTube with the material so people can can enjoy it. Yeah, I'll get with you uh, before I upload this, and I'll get all that information, uh, any links or whatever, and cool. listeners, they will be in the description below. Please check them out and uh, support Womp Stomp. Uh, they do some amazing stuff. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Sean? 
closing statements? Um, like I said, absolutely fantastic film. I was blown away when I saw this. I mean, it's it's been a while since I've seen a Friday the Thirteenth that actually uh, got me excited to finish it, and I'm I'm very excited to see more. I mean, the moment uh, crowdfunding started for the second one, I had to jump on that. Uh, so Thank I'm you. very excited for the the rest of these movies and the different directions it can go in, and um. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check out this YouTube channel and um, all the other material here. Um, like, like Josh said, thank you for coming on. Um, this was a fantastic episode. This may be the... I'm not going to hopefully not jinx it. I think this is like the first episode we haven't had one single cut. Yeah. Watch it happen like right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, so that about wraps up this episode. And join us on After the Slash uh, on Patreon if you have that. We're going to be doing our kind of after show where we discuss a couple off-topic topics and um, just kind of decompress from the stress of the episode. So, uh, I'm Scott Campbell. <laughs> All that Thanks stress. for stopping by. All the stress. Yeah, you right. left out one one thing, Sean, about how awesome uh, Never Hike Alone is. Or Right there. Right there. Cool. I mean, that is one of the best looks. <laughs> well, love- we should talk about it in After the Slash. If you, wanted, if you want an inside look about how we made that costume and how it came to be, well, we should definitely yeah. Our patron, if you're, not, you can see bucks per month. Help the channel. Uh, help get keep these books coming because they are very expensive. Uh, <laughs> love you all to each other, and uh, we will see you next time. And this is Sean Campbell saying, if this one doesn't scare you, you're already dead.